Well, good morning everyone. I hope the technology is all working a bit better today. Welcome to our service wherever you are as we begin our journey towards Easter. It's great to be united at the foot of the cross once again. Let's think of some intimations first of all before we begin our service. Welcome. Well, as I say, we're going to start looking today at the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross as our preparation for Easter this year. Do leave comments on YouTube or email comments or questions into me on my email address. There it is on the screen. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, we are getting closer to 100, but we're not there yet. Remember, if we get to 100, we're allowed to change the channel name on the URL, and that would be really handy for us, rather than a big silly number. So do, do subscribe on the YouTube channel if you haven't subscribed yet. Do also like and comment on the video because that helps get us noticed on Facebook, on YouTube as well. I forgot to mention last week that the Dumblain World Day of Prayer service, we were hosting it, but obviously due to the restrictions, we were unable to do that in person. So we had it online on this channel on Friday night and I, I found a version of the World Day of Prayer written by the the women who put together the material from the, the from Vanuatu, and so we we premiered that service on the YouTube channel. It's still there. I think over fifty people have watched it. Do feel free to. It's only half an hour. Quite amazing to hear from these women in Vanuatu and also to see the place. Quite an amazing place and to hear of their struggles and to pray with them and for them. So do do make use of that on the the Dublin St Blaine's channel. Remember Thursdays at Le Cropped is online and it's on again this Thursday. <coughs> it's the last of the newer films and this, the title of this week's one is What Jesus Got to Do With Me. So do, do join us for a bit of fun and fellowship online and also to be encouraged and challenged as we watch the films from your Scripture Union Island which are very, very good. They're obviously there on the, the channel as well if you want to catch up. Immediately after the service, we'll have some tea and coffee on Zoom and have a blether and a chat with each other. It's important to keep connecting with each other and to give ourselves to each other. So do join us. There's the meeting ID and the password. I'll put it up at the end of the service. Thanks to all those who have sent me uh, crosses. Let's see if we can give you some kind of idea of how many we've got. We've got loads and loads and loads. Hundreds, we're really grateful for them. Another bag here as well. So thank you for that. If you're still knitting, don't worry, you can still take part. What we've got, I've got the banners now. What we're going to do is put a banner upside outside each of our two churches, and a box. We'll use the Perspex box in St Blaine's. We'll put a box up on the gate in Lecroft. We'll put the crosses in it, and we're asking people if they want to to tie a cross to the railings as a symbol of hope given all that we've been through this year. So I'll put the banners up probably towards the end of this coming week. If, it would be really good if people could go and start doing that because as soon as people see them up on the, on the railings, they will be more inclined to join in. So if you're passing either St Blaine's or Le Cropped or do make a point of going and doing this to get across out of the box, in either church and tie it to the railings or to the gate and let's get uh, as these symbols of hope we've got plenty of crosses or maybe we'd hope to maybe make a bigger cross out of the smaller ones and have it displayed probably in the porch area of St Blaine so do do get involved in that but thanks very much if you've been knitting and keep going because the more the merrier uh, contributions for the two newsletters need to be in this week Remember the Le Croc quiz thing? We've almost finished here in the Mans, although the, the town and cities one is stumping us, but we've almost got the rest filled in. Still time for that. It's the end of, uh, it's the end of, uh, uh, end of March and the chance to win up to £50 if you first at the, the hat in each of the categories. Remember, I'm still, I'm still looking for your opinion of what the main thing is that we do in our churches. What's the main thing that we are about? What are our convictions and what can what are our convictions? What do we believe? How does that lead us to do what we should be doing as church? So do send them to me. So let's begin our worship together. 
uh, the psalmist says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let's rejoice in the mercy and grace and forgiveness that Jesus brings us through the cross. Let's worship our God as we sing our first hymn, O oh, bless the Lord my soul. join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we gather wherever we are to bless you. We come with the souls that you have created within us to praise your name. We come to use our tongues to rejoice in your divine mercies. Lord, we, your people, have heard and know of your great mercy, your amazing grace, your redeeming love. And so we gather together, grateful for that mercy, grace and love. Today we rejoice that you have not forgotten us. Today we say that we have not forgotten you. Yet even as we say that, Lord, we, we are aware of the times we have forgotten you. The times when we have heard your teaching, Jesus, and have not followed your example. Lord, we confess those times. We confess the times also when we have deliberately chosen to disobey you. And also the times when we have not even realised that we have disobeyed you. Lord, as we confess, we rejoice that you are the God of grace, the God of mercy, the God of love, who hears our cries and forgives. Today we rejoice in you, Jesus. You who through your death, through your blood, through your cross, offer forgiveness. So today, Lord, we rejoice in that forgiveness. We repent and turn away from our sins and we ask that you would crown our lives with love, that you would set us free, ransomed by your blood. Help us to rejoice being in your presence knowing that when we are in you, we are indeed saved from hell. And help us to walk the talk, pointing everyone to you, Jesus, the source of mercy, 
grace and love. And here is now, Lord, as we join in your prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Amen. Let's cross over to South Queensferry and hear what Zach has to say to us this week. Good morning, everybody. So today we're going to be looking at quite a big subject or quite a little one. It depends what you're going through and what your term of big and small is. So today we're looking at change. And in my opinion, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. And how does God fit into change? Well, Hopefully we can get to the bottom of it. As we know, change is inevitable. But I really believe that how we approach change and our attitude towards change defines if it's going to be good or bad. Now in my experience, approaching change with prayer and preparation with God and knowing that it's what God wants for you can make the whole thing so much easier and it's so much easier to understand as well so what does that look like in my short time my only short time where i've been with you guys here at st blaine's and the crops many changes have happened i remember what the first time i ever stepped into the church that was a huge change and let me tell you that was full of prayer i was so unsure I had Gary and a couple of others fantastic people with me to get through that, but most of all, I had God with me in that situation. A couple months go by. I'm sure all of us remember the time where St. Blaine's was going through a huge interior change. That was hugely challenging for a lot of people. But yet again, we proved that when we put God in the center of change, everything works out for the best. Now, like I said before, change can be big or small. Let me tell you something about a small change. As you can see, my wife recently cut my hair. Now that was a two hour battle and that was a huge change for me, but a small change for others. It's all about perception. Or when you get new shoes, getting used to shoes, it's change and it's quite uncomfortable. But I think if change is uncomfortable, it's a good thing because it allows us to learn from that change. And I believe that's what God wants for us is to learn from change and to go with it and be more grown up about things. So, is, ch is change a good thing? If you've got the attitude for it and you let God lead the way, absolutely. Now, if you're not going through any significant change, or even a small, big change, whatever, I guarantee, or I'm pretty confident that someone you know is, whether that be changing, changing environments, changing year at school, going back into school for the first time in months. Um, just, if you know these people, let's somehow encourage them. So I want to have a look at what the Bible says about change and what we can learn from that. So it says in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, it says, The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. That is God directly telling us, don't fear. He's already got it. Now I've got one more verse for you. It says, the Lord your God who goes before you and will himself fight on your behalf. That's in Deuteronomy 1 verse 30. Now if we have a God that fights for us, loves us, cares for us, and wants what's best for us, even in times of change, big or small, let's let God be the center of change. Let him be the leader. He's already gone before you. He's already laid out that path for you. So don't fight it. Let God be in control. Amen. Thanks, Zach. That's quite a change to your hairstyle, mate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's have our modern song. 
It's another one from Sovereign Grace Music, who have given people the, the permission to stream their uh, songs online. And it's all about forgiveness, which is quite clearly ties in with the, the first saying of Jesus on the cross. It's called Forgiven. Now, I know we don't know this, but let's uh, use these words to reflect on how we have been forgiven by Christ. Dressed in righteous deeds to hide All the stains below We have judged your sons and daughters For the sin that is our own May we now forgive each other And lay down a stone things we wish to own. We forsake the feast above for all the crumbs below. Though you made us sons and daughters, we do not the world disown. May we find our greatest treasure is in you reminder of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Let's remind ourselves from God's word about those uh, sayings of three of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. The first, the second and the seventh one are recorded in Luke chapter 23 and Isabel Gunn is going to read from verse 26 today. So look out and listen out for the three sayings of Jesus in this reading. Today's reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 26 to 46, the crucifixion and Jesus' death. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, 
and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women, who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, Save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land till the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what ha had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Isabel. So, as I said, in our preparations for Easter this year, we're going to focus on the seven, seven statements of Jesus on the cross. And there they are before you. As we walk in this journey, <coughs> there is a classic book by Arthur W. Pink called The Seven Sayings of the Saviour on the Cross. I would certainly recommend uh, reading that book if you're looking for a book to read during this season and it will certainly will accompany well much of our walk through these statements the seven sayings of the saviour on the cross A.W. Pink <clears throat> so let's look at the first one this week let's make a start on these seven sayings and focus on the first one the very first thing that Jesus says having been nailed to the cross that he carried up the hill of Golgotha. The first thing that he says after his cross is raised up. The first thing that he says as his body hangs on those nails and he begins to suffer that indescribable pain of crucifixion. 
and his the very first thing is he faces his death. What is the very first thing that he says? He says, Father, forgive. It's a statement of wondrous grace, isn't it? That Jesus, the Son of God, who has been nailed to a cross, who is beginning to suffer in a way that we is unimaginable to us, that his first thought, that his first word, that his prayer would be to seek forgiveness for those that had, who had nailed him there. How powerful is this that Jesus says this from the cross? How powerful this prayer is because he's praying to his Father. Father, forgive. Are you surprised that this is the first statement? Are you surprised that this would this what Jesus would think for those who are killing him? What would you have expected Jesus to say? What would we say in that situation? Well, in many ways, it was expected that Jesus would say that from the cross. Because we will see that much of what Jesus says on the cross has been prophesied centuries before. In Isaiah 53, Arthur Pink reminds us that we hear of at least 10 things about the humiliation or suffering of Jesus on the cross. He is suffering and dying for the sin of many. But look what Isaiah says at the end of verse 12. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So in a way it is to be expected that Jesus prays, Father, forgive, as he suffers on the cross. Because Isaiah prophesied that he would. But there's another reason why it's expected that Jesus would pray such a thing. Jesus has spent three years teaching people, teaching his disciples, teaching his followers how to follow him. And he said to his disciples and followers in Luke chapter 6, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others, Luke 6 verse 31, as you would have them do to you. It's not unexpected that Jesus prays for his enemies. It's not unexpected that Jesus prays for those who cursed him on the cross. It's not unexpected that Jesus prays for those who are mistreating him in the ultimate way because Jesus is practicing what he preaches. He has taught his disciples how they should face times like this and he is a living example as he goes through it for his disciples. So we should not be surprised that Jesus prays, Father, forgive. Now we may be surprised, and to be fair, I think Arthur Pink is a bit surprised that Jesus prays to his Father for the Father to forgive them. Especially when Jesus has already said in his teaching ministry that he himself has the power and authority to forgive sins. Remember the the man lowered through the roof? Matthew 9 verse 6. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralysed man, get up, take your mat and go home. 
You may wonder then, why does Jesus not forgive the people himself when he has the authority to do it? it? Why does he ask his father to forgive? Now, Pink and others suggest that perhaps one reason for this is the the forsakenness or the separation from the Father that he will experience on the cross is beginning. Pink suggests that Jesus has been lifted up from the earth and that's why he no longer is willing to forgive himself. That might be true, but I think something else is probably more right I read a a sermon that Charles Spurgeon preached on this very verse during the week. And oh my goodness, let's just say it makes my sermons look like complete froth. But Spurgeon says that Jesus' forgiveness of them is taken for granted by us. Why? Well, we have seen Jesus' teaching. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. We take it for granted that Jesus is forgiving them for doing this to him. Jesus said Spurgeon is being altogether unselfish. So it's more likely that Jesus, who's had a lifetime of praying to his father. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? That was his normal routine. A lifetime of pattern of praying to his father is again giving us another Example of how we should react. Another pattern for us that we should be praying that the people who abuse us would know the Father's forgiveness. As we've just prayed in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Let's not lose sight of the fact that this first statement, we also see something really, really powerful though. In this first statement, we see the ultimate need of human beings. The ultimate need of human beings is the need to be forgiven by God. The first thing Jesus prays for on the cross is that people would be Forgiven. That's our greatest need, to be forgiven by God for our sin. That's why Jesus is dying on the cross, to bear our sin, to be the atonement, as we saw in Leviticus when we studied that. To take away the sin that can only be dealt with by God through the shedding of blood. So in this first statement we see an important lesson that we as sinners are unfit for the presence of God, says Pink. That Christ's actions and through his words we see that a righteous ground has been provided on which God can be just and also justifier. As Jesus dies, God's justice that we should know is being poured out onto him. And through him, we are being justified. We are being made right. As Jesus prays, Father, forgive. We see that God can judge, but also show mercy at the same time. The most important, the greatest need that we have as human beings is to be forgiven by God. Spurgeon in his sermon on this verse says this, As to all the evils that afflict humanity, by all means take your share in battling with them. Let temperance be maintained, let education be supported, let reforms, political and ecclesiastical, be pushed forward as far as you have the time and the effort to spare. But the first business of every Christian man and woman is with the hearts and consciences of men as they stand before the everlasting God. Our greatest need is to be forgiven by God. 
our greatest task. And amongst all the other good and great things that we do as believers, as church, is to tell people that forgiveness is offered. Spurgeon continues, Oh, let nothing turn you aside from your divine errand of mercy to undying souls. This is your one business. Tell to sinners that sin will damn them, that Christ alone can take away sin and make this the one passion of your souls. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Let them know how to be forgiven. Let them be actually forgiven. And let me never rest except as I am the means of bringing sinners to be forgiven. Even the guiltiest of them. That's why the Friday is called Good Friday. That we can be forgiven by God. Even the guiltiest. This is the good news of the gospel. First and foremost, our greatest need as human beings is to know the forgiveness of God. The first thing Jesus prays on the cross as he dies to offer that forgiveness is, Father, forgive them. And that them is important, isn't it? He says, Father, forgive them. Who? are or who is the them that Jesus is praying for? Is Jesus asking for forgiveness for Pilate who handed him over to be crucified? Is Jesus praying for forgiveness for those that have nailed him to the cross? Is it for the mockers and the sneerers, the chief priests and the passers-by? Now none of them deserved his prayer, yet he prayed for them. That moment of wondrous grace. He prays asking his father to forgive those that are killing him. Spurgeon said he loved this prayer because of the indistinctiveness of it. He loved it because Jesus prayed for them without saying who the them was. So when Jesus prays father forgive them he gives hope to every sinner. Who would ever come to him and pray for mercy. We too, says Spurgeon, are among the them that Jesus prayed for God to forgive. Into that pronoun them, says Spurgeon, I feel I can crawl. Can you get in there? Oh, by a humble faith appropriate to the cross of Christ, by trusting in it, and get into that big little word, them. Jesus prays for those at the foot of the cross. He also prays for us. Father, forgive them. Our greatest need is to be forgiven by God. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What do you make of that statement? Pink and others, many others of course, all indicate that they know exactly what they're doing. They have called for him to be crucified. Pilate has handed him over knowing that he would be crucified. The soldiers are doing their job in crucifying him. They know what they are doing. They are killing this man. And there's the rub. We see they are blind to who the man is. Remember Jesus was condemned by the teachers of the law because he said he was God. That was blasphemy in their eyes, in their ears. They couldn't accept the divinity of Christ. They were all blind to who he really was. They rejected his divinity. They thought they were crucifying a man. And their reaction condemns them and makes them above all in the need of that grace and forgiveness that ironically the one dying before them can bring. 
They don't know they're killing the Son of God. Now, ignorance is no excuse, especially when they have been told something, especially when you've been told what's right and what's wrong. If you then pretend you're ignorant of it, that's no excuse in a court of law. They knew what they were doing. They should have known who Jesus was. They had been told in Isaiah what to expect. The suffering servant. Jesus had told them often who he was and pointed to the scriptures. Jesus is saying they do not know what they're doing because they are rejecting him as Lord and Saviour. A conscious rejection. He is praying that they will know forgiveness. They will know the forgiveness that is being achieved by his death. But most at the foot of that cross continue to reject. And they don't know what they're going to, they're doing because they don't realise the judgement they're bringing upon themselves. But others do see the Roman centurion that we heard Isabel reminding us of. Sees Jesus died and he recognises Jesus as righteous. One of the thieves, as we will see recognises that Jesus is perfect and does not deserve what he is receiving and he is saved. Many in the crowd at Pentecost when Peter calls for it, preaches about this and calls for repentance, believe and are saved. Ever since this day, people have heard the gospel, believed and have been saved. Jesus' prayer is answered for the them who accept. Let's think for a moment about how this affects us. Wherever you are in 2021, there was a budget this week, apparently, <laughs> if you were paying attention. And it, obviously in the days after the budget, there is always on our television news or our newspapers or our web pages, what does the budget mean for you? And they try to explain what all the technical financial stuff that's been described and changed means for you and for me. Most of us don't bother because we know what it means. But what does Jesus saying, Father, forgive, mean for you and for me? Father, forgive. Forgiveness is the most important need of a human being. To live and die without that forgiveness is a dreadful place to be in. That's why in the context of these verses, there's all that stuff about blessed are the women who have no children. Those who ask the mountains to fall on them, to hide them. That Those verses are about judgment. Those who reject the forgiveness that Jesus offers. How terrible that those days are going to be. The most important need people have is to know that Jesus comes to forgive. We heard Spurgeon telling us that. This week I got an email from the Try Praying people. We've got the banner up and normally our wee box is full of their, their wee books. But the, the Try Praying email just this week totally reflected what Spurgeon had said. The Try Praying people said, The church is good at caring for those in need but not so good at helping people become Christians. Across thousands of churches and agencies, food is given for the hungry and help for the destitute. Good things, rightly so. We should feel proud, they say. But we're not so good at help people come to faith, to know forgiveness. Try praying offer as a challenge and say we can fix this. They say I have a challenge for everyone who is reading this just now. If you would like to someone you know to become a Christian, then do this. Pray for them between now and Easter, that they would come to believe in Jesus Christ. Pray for them every day and see what happens. Pray that God would speak to them and also that they would have an opportunity to hear the message about Jesus. You may want to pray with a few others who have friends who they want to become Christians. That's it, they say. 
our application for Father forgive is to go and to tell people that Jesus brings mercy and forgiveness. To pray like Jesus prayed. To follow his pattern. Father forgive. What about the them? If forgiveness is our greatest need not only does Jesus pray for that forgiveness he provides the way to know forgiveness. As we heard from Spurgeon we rejoice that we are included in that gracious them. If Jesus can pray that for the people that are killing him we can also know that there is nothing that you have done that means you are outside of grace. Nothing that you or anyone else has done that stops the wondrous grace enveloping them. If you feel as if Christ cannot possibly love you because love you because you have done something, then bring it to Christ and know that He has forgiven it. You're justified, completely free in the eyes of God. And also you would use that as a spur that nobody that we encounter, no matter how good or mostly bad they are, God's grace is for them as it is for us. And lastly, for they do not know what they are doing. Remember, Jesus is living out his own teaching. He is loving his enemies. He is praying for them. He is seeking for them to know God's mercy and forgiveness, as well as his own forgiveness. Who do we need to pray for? Who do we need to forgive? Who needs God's forgiveness? How do we live what we pray in the Lord's Prayer every week? Forgive my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Pink says some strong things in this chapter about this. That if we forgive and people don't repent, then we are not to forgive them. I'm not sure about that at all. I understand that only God can forgive. When we forgive somebody else, we don't actually change anything in them. It must be something about us. Only God can do that. We are to forgive as Jesus forgave. And as we forgive the person who has done something to us, we hope and pray that they will repent and know God's forgiveness. But we leave that between them and God. None of that affects us. Our task is to pray that God would forgive them, to forgive them ourselves and not let it dwell in our hearts, not let it eat away in us. Jesus is our example in this. It's difficult, but that's what we are called to do. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. There's such depth to that one statement. There's such depth to everything that happens on that cross, as we will see. This first statement typifies that. Pink says, here we see the triumph of redeeming love. Wondrous grace given to those who do not deserve it. If you know Christ, you know that grace and that mercy. You know that Jesus' prayer has been answered for you. But let's go and tell those who do not know this. Those who have rejected him in the past. Those who continue to reject him. Those who are going to be under the judgment of God if they do not know Jesus as their saviour. Everything changed that day on the, at the, at the cross. We changed that day on the cross. If you have been forgiven. Today we go into the world to also pray, Father forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Amen.
these verses are really powerful and I hope you're able to spend a bit of time reflecting on them today and maybe during the week. In fact, why don't you do that during this week? Just let that one verse meditate on it throughout each day. See where God leads you in prayer. But let's begin that process of responding as we have our organ recital for today. It's a minuet in F. Now, I'm grateful that Mike is now sending me uh, tips on how to say some of these things. Wilhelm Lutius, I take it he's Dutch, has written a minuet in F. And let's hear it being played by Mike. Thanks, Mike. Let's have uh, the first of two hymns which talk about forgiveness and help us to contemplate our place in uh, what Jesus has said and our ex uh, challenge and exhortation to follow Jesus' example. The first one is forgive our sins as we forgive.
Let's come and pray for us each other as we respond to God's word. Let's pray for our world and its need of forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your prayer for us on the cross. Thank you for including us in the forgiveness that you have offered. Thank you for the way you came to restore us to into your Father's arms. Lord, as we begin again to walk towards Easter, help us to marvel again at what you have done for us. Help us understand a bit more of your Father's love. Help us to know a bit more about the depth of your achievement on that cross. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. And may he enable us to go and serve the world. But as we serve, to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Holy Spirit, help us as we seek to follow Jesus' example. Help us to deal with the pain that others have inflicted on us. Help us to pray, Lord, Father, forgive our sins as we forgive the sins of others. Lord God, is the as the snowdrops appear again in our ground, as we come again to the beginning of this week, we pray for those who continue to live with the consequences and devastation that others have inflicted on them and those that they loved. Lord, continue to work your peace and assurance into their lives. And may their example, Lord, continue to inspire us. We pray, Lord, that the actions of others will not have such a hold over them and us. That you would break that hold that causes people to continually suffer. Help us all, Lord, if we can't forgive, to hand these painful things over to you, to leave them at the foot of the cross, to leave you to judge those who haven't repented. But Jesus, we ask you to heal us. Lord, we pray for MAF as they have asked us to pray for any this week who have experienced unfair treatment. Lord, you empathise with any because you faced it all. Lord, help us to, to be a listening ear. To share with those that we trust if we feel unfairly treated. Help us all to be agents of healing as we bring you into every situation. We pray for those in our church families, Lord, those that we know and love who are in ill or in hospital, those facing surgery even this week. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them and we ask that for your blessing upon those who are, will care and are caring for them that through them, Lord Jesus, they will be kept well and safe. Lord, as we prepare to receive our accounts in both of our churches, we give our resources, our stewardship to you. We give all of our offerings. Lord, challenge us if we are not giving a fitting proportion to give more and thank you Lord for those that do that those that take their worship of you seriously through their offering we give you thanks for the resources that we have in both of our congregations and we ask Lord Jesus that all of these resources would be used to proclaim the forgiveness of sins 
For we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's close with the second hymn about forgiveness. Where shall my wandering soul begin? So now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.